All righty. Welcome, everyone. My name is Peggy Reckonzone, and on behalf of the College of Central Florida District Board of Trustees, Dr. James Henningsen, our college president, and the Ocala Royal Dames, I want to welcome all the guests in our audiences and our guests online for attending this Shop Talk presentation. The Shop Talk program started 20 years ago inside of a hair salon focusing on breast health and education for African American women. Since that time, this program has grown to include women and men of all ages, races, ethnicities, covering awareness, prevention, and treatment opportunities for all cancers they may afflict each individual today. Many incredible organizations have been involved in support of this program over the years. Monroe Regional Medical Center, which is now Advent Health, American Cancer Society, Ocala Health, and of course, the Ocala Royal Dames. On behalf of the College of Central Florida, I wanna thank the Ocala Royal Dames for their continued efforts in financial support, not only for this program, but for the research that is funded and the educational opportunities available. For our audience, if you have any questions for our guest speaker, please post them in the comments. We'll have the opportunity to have our presenter today answer any questions from the, our online audience. Um, and now, Dr. Nally Silver. Dr. Nally Silver is a head and neck surgical oncologist and assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Florida. Prior to her faculty appointment, she completed a head and neck cancer research and clinical fellowship at the UTMD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. She has a busy clinical practice at UF Shands, focused on treating both benign and malignant tumors of the head and neck. Dr. Silver is the primary investigator of a funded translational research lab developing novel immunotherapies for patients with treatment-resistant head and neck cancers. Dr. Silver, I'll let you take over. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, I'm hoping you guys can see my screen out there. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you uh, to all the sponsors, uh, specifically the Ocala Royal Dames who have really uh, been incredibly helpful in my uh, research as well as the College of Central Florida for allowing uh, me this opportunity. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about head and neck cancer, which I've you know really dedicated my career to. Uh, specifically today, uh, I was asked to talk about a clinical aspect that I thought was important that, that the community should know about. So I'm going to focus on HPV or human papillomavirus uh, related head and neck cancer. Um, and then I'm going to switch gears uh, towards the second half in which I really talk about the research that has been funded by both the NIH as well as the Ocala Royal Dames and talk about uh, the platform that I've been developing here with partners at the University of Florida, which is a therapeutic RNA nanoparticle vaccine, which is uh, you know, quite uh, popular and interesting right now as it is a similar uh, technology to the COVID vaccine, which uh, many people um, have either been vaccinated or are, are obviously aware of. Um, so, uh, as Peggy mentioned, uh, uh, my name is Natalie Silver. I am assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery here at UF Health. Uh, I am a head and neck surgical oncologist. I see patients uh, uh, every week in clinic, as well as uh, operating on them in the operating room. And I also run a translational research lab um, in order to better serve my patients and you know, learn more about their disease with the ultimate goal of curing their cancer. So just some basics of head and neck cancer. Um, head and neck cancer really uh, is a variable uh, type of cancer. It can affect many parts of the head and neck. And it accounts for about three to 5% of all cancers. It's not really con considered rare um, even though that seems like a small amount, um, but it still is um, a pretty prevalent cancer uh, in the United States and, this, and also in this region in um, Alachua uh, and, and is a very big cancer in our catchment area. It's the sixth most common cancer globally. It affects males more than females, usually uh, between the ages of 50 and 60. And the subtype is primarily squamous cell carcinoma. So when we talk about cancers of the head and neck, um, as you can see, there's a variety of locations and subsites. 
So there is the front of the tongue, the, the anterior oral cavity is what we call it, which involves the front of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the hard palate, the jaw. Now, these types of cancers can be very different from the back of the throat, which involves the tonsil, the tongue base. They are primarily cancers of the linings, which is squamous cell carcinoma. So that is primarily a cancer involving the linings of the throat and mouth. However, in the head and neck, we can also get salivary gland cancers. Um, so we have salivary glands in the neck. We have salivary glands in, in some called a parotid gland, which involves the face. And these have different, all different kinds of, of subtypes. So the, the treatment can be very different depending on what area of the head and neck we're talking about. And the nasopharynx, for example, has a, has a very different type of treatment uh, as well. And larynx cancer, again, is uh, another subsite uh, that can be involved primarily with squamous cell carcinoma, but the treatments are, are incredibly different um, between, say, the larynx and the mouth. So the, the head and neck, um, can, can't, treating cancers of head and neck can often be very complicated and, and, and variable. One other cancer that I'm sure many of you have heard about is thyroid cancer, and that is actually encompassed in what I do. Uh, I operate a lot on uh, patients with thyroid cancer. It affects women uh, more than men, um, and that is more of an endocrine type cancer, And um, but that is also within the purview of, head and neck, of the head and neck cancer I wanted to focus uh, primarily on cancers involving the oropharynx and the anterior oral cavity because, as you know, as you can tell, there's a lot of different uh, pathologies and treatments that, that can happen in the head and neck, and so uh, I wanted to focus in on these two areas. So head and neck cancer is on the rise. Um, if you look here in the uh, category of the male category, these are new cancers uh, uh, per year. This is a, from a couple of years ago, but um, oral cavity and pharynx, as you can see, kind of broke through here in the top 10 cancers. And so this is a, a rising cancer, a significant cancer. And when you look at the females, you can see here thyroid made it to the top here. So thyroid cancer in females is, is quite significant and oral cavity and pharynx is on the rise in males. And I'll explain why during this talk. So really what uh, we're talking about with the cancers that are on the rise for head and neck is the oropharynx. And so I just wanted to briefly give you an introduction onto the oropharynx anatomy. In the last slide, I showed you that there are all different kinds of cancers that can, can affect the different subsites of the head and neck. But the cancer that I'm gonna talk about now is uh, affecting the oropharynx, which involves the back or posterior one third of the tongue. So cancers that come from here, as well as the tonsils, and as well as the soft palate. So that is basically the oropharynx. It's just that area. And that's that very um, lymphoid rich region where there's a lot of lymphocytes. It's very different actually than, than the front of the mouth, although it's all connected and it seems like it would be more similar. They're very, very different. And most of you guys know that um, you know, Michael Douglas is, is one of the very famous people that uh, have this uh, cancer, that has this cancer, has been very public about it. Um, you know, their, their headline saying, you know, virus gave me cancer. And so uh, H HPV virus, which is a human papillomavirus, is the uh, you know, virus that, that affected uh, uh, Michael Douglas and has kind of popularized uh, this cancer. So traditionally, when you think of head and neck cancer, uh, you think about it being caused by smoking and drinking. And now this type is declining. As many of you realize, you know, smoking in general is on, on the down trend. Um, you know, there have been lots of uh, uh, public initiatives to decrease smoking in public places, things like that. And so tobacco related cancers are on the, on the decline. However, there is an alarming increase in oropharynx cancer, which I mentioned is, is the cancer that affects the tonsils and tongue base specifically in white non-smoking middle-aged men in ages 40 to 60. Human papillomavirus is now the main cause of oropharynx cancer. Now, about seven to 10 years ago, it wasn't. It was tobacco smoke was still the main cause of oropharynx cancer, but it has now, HPV virus has now the main cause of this type of cancer. And really an epidemic of HPV related oropharynx cancer um, has caused a surpass now of even cervical cancer. And so kind of a picture 
uh, is worth a thousand words. And um, you can see here, this is the cervical cancer. So this is a cervical cancer line. This is also from a couple years ago, but this is relevant. And you can see it's declining. This, could, this is in part because of pap smears, routine surveillance, um, uh, different types of initiatives to try to prevent this cancer. And as you can see, or pharynx cancer is on the, in, in, on the rise and has surpassed cervical cancer. And so now it is actually uh, a cancer that is more common, uh, commonly diagnosed than cervical cancer. So what is HPV? So HPV or human papillomavirus is a DNA virus that infects mucocutaneous lining. So as I mentioned at the beginning, squamous cell carcinoma, so the cancers of the head and neck really affect these linings of your mouth, of your tonsil, of your palate. And there are many different subtypes of HPV. There's about 200 subtypes and most of them do not cause cancer. However, there are several subtypes, including HPV-16, HPV-18, and these are just numbers that are assigned to different types of, of viruses that are associated with cancers, including cervical, anal, penile cancers, as well as head and neck cancers. And HPV is actually the most commonly sexually transmitted infection in the US. And many Americans have this. So if you were to survey an average teenager, 18 year old, a lot of them are infected with HPV, actively infected with HPV viruses. So approximately 26 million, which is, which is a lot of people have an oral HPV infection. Now that is alarming, but most of these, the, the vast, vast majority are not infected by the virus that causes cancer. You know, they are just these, uh, there's many, many subtypes and they get an infection and it goes away and people are fine. Now, that being said, there are a small amount, so approximately 2,600 uh, uh, in the population at a given time have the HPV 16 or the higher risk HPV infection. And even then, even if you get infected with HPV 16 or one of the more um, serious viruses, the vast majority of, in, of individuals will, will clear this infection naturally with their own immune response. They'll never know they were infected. They will never get cancer and they will never know they had it and they will just move on with the rest of their lives. No problem. So there's really no associated symptoms with oral HPV infection. And there's really no treatment for it because most people get it. It's passed along in the uh, environment and they don't even realize they have it. It doesn't cause any problems. Many people just clear the virus within two years. Now there is a, a two different kinds of peaks of this virus. One that is um, during sort of the teenage years around 18 and then one that can happen later on in life uh, towards the 40s or 50s. And in some people, the infection may persist, and this is where the problems arise, and this is what can happen in the patients that eventually get cancer, is that they get a, a, an infection years ago, decades ago, and the, the virus takes up shop in some of the cells in the tonsil or the tongue base, and then decades later, because of reasons that we're not really sure, uh, maybe it, it, there's uh, other uh, factors such as smoking, different, different things that contribute, for some reason, the, the virus then uh, causes a cancer many, many years later. And HPV positive cancers are very biologically and clinically distinct to the other smoking, drinking associated cancers of the head and neck. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The outcomes are very different than your sort of traditional smoking related cancers that you kind of imagine uh, when you think of head and neck cancer. Um, when you see the uh, smoking related ads, you know, when you see patients with uh, laryngectomies and things like that and and big jaw surgery, you know, those are sort of the, the the images that come into mind when we think of head and neck cancer that's related to cigarettes or smoking. And, you know, these the patient population that is affected by this cancer is, is very, very different and the outcomes are much different. So it usually affects white males from ages 35 to 55 and um, much more likely a male over a female. So it's about four to one over females. And the risk of HPV infection and oropharynx cancer increases with the number of oral sex partners and number of sexual partners. And 
And as you can imagine, in patients that have a weakened immune system, so their defenses are not adequate to fight different viruses or move on from, from an infection or clear an infection, such as patients with HIV or AIDS or on immune suppressive drugs because of organ transplants, these patients are more likely to uh, get uh, HPV related cancers or any type of really viral related cancers. So some of the symptoms. So most of them are somewhat asymptomatic, but usually what it does is it starts as a tongue base or tonsil mask, ma mask, excuse me. Most people don't really complain of everything, maybe a little sore throat, maybe throat irritation. They may notice a swollen tonsil. You know, so I've had some patients come in and say, doc, you know, I was looking in my mouth and I saw that one of my tonsils is swollen and that could be a presenting symptoms. But the most common presentation is a neck mass or lump. And so this usually the sort of classic story you get is uh, doc I was shaving and I noticed you know there's this mass there so it's usually not something that's really bothering somebody. And so you can see just kind of a picture of a sort of typical patient, so you can see this mass here in the neck, so this is what we call sort of level two uh, neck mass and then. Um, you know, he may have noticed it incidentally when he was maybe his wife noticed maybe he was shaving maybe his primary care doctor noticed. And then when you look in his mouth, you kind of see this red area, this mass. And so this is a, a left-sided tonsil cancer that has spread to the lymph nodes here. And usually we don't really find these patients until it has spread to the lymph nodes. And so you, what I really tell everybody, what I tell my residents, what I tell anyone who wants to listen to, if a neck mass in an adult lasts for more than two weeks, you must investigate it further. So, you know, some of the mistakes that can happen when people are not looking for this or aware of this is that a patient can come in and, uh, you know, their, their doctor, their primary doctor thinks that, oh, this is a tonsil infection, which is completely reasonable to think of as a first initial thing. You know, the patient gets on placed on antibiotics for a couple weeks and it doesn't go away. And, you know, at that point, a lot red flags should come up. And I think referral at that point is completely indicated. Um, that is, you know, we don't want to wait for multiple courses of antibiotics. Most of the time, adults that have tonsil infections, they don't get big, huge lymph nodes. Now, in a child, it's completely different. You know, if you've ever had a kid uh, with strep throat at home, you know that they can get really huge swollen tonsils and really huge, ginormous lymph nodes in their neck. And, um, and that's normal in a kid because kids have these really robust reactive immune systems and they just kind of you know really react to these uh these uh infections adults not so much you know they they don't respond um as robustly to to infections and so you really need to have that alarm or suspicion up when someone an adult is complaining of a neck mass and you know sore throat uh it really if it doesn't go away you, you really need to take it seriously and so is there any screening? People ask me that, you know, what can I do to prevent this? So really screening, um, at this point, there's not routine testing for this. There have been investigations and studies that have looked into oral swabs, and they have seen the persistence of HPV DNA in patients that have the cancer, but there really isn't any routinely uh, uh, advised screening. That being said, dentists are great at picking these things up. You know, dentists do full oral, oral and oropharyngeal exams. They're supposed to look at the neck. I've had many dental referrals uh, for oropharynx cancer. And the dentists really saved these patients' lives because some of them don't go see uh, their primary care doctors. And so they uh, you know, are great at identifying these and, and referring them promptly. And then also just having routine uh, examinations by your primary care doctor. Your primary care doctor um, can pick up on these. So I just wanted to talk to you about some of the advances of treatment of this cancer. So once a patient is diagnosed with oropharynx cancer, one of the more uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, interesting uh, things that are happening surgically in the field is a transoral robotic surgery. So you can see a picture here. So this is the uh, an example of a da Vinci robot. You see there's this robot here with all these uh, you know, neat looking arms and this is the camera arm. And so you can see here how the camera basically goes into the patient's mouth and then we can use these robotic arms in order to remove the tonsil or the tongue base you know, to perform a pretty complicated surgery. And you see this, this person here sitting here with the suction. So this person is not actually the surgeon. He's just the assistant. He is suctioning the smoke away. 
And the surgeon is actually across the room at a console, sort of looking into this three dimensional uh, robotic system um, and controlling the arms. And so we, we do that, we offer that here at, at, at the University of Florida for early stage uh, orofar oropharyngeal cancer patients. And, um, you know, the studies uh, have been conducted to see uh, what the outcomes are. You know, some of the studies have demonstrated that the outcomes are similar to, to standard therapies. Uh, we're still kind of learning about it. It's newer technology. It's only been around. Uh, we've been only been doing it, um, it for maybe five, five or so years, maybe a little bit more. And um, generally, though, it's very safe and it can reduce uh, potential need for further treatment. Now, not everybody is a candidate for this robotic surgery. You know, if a patient has really large neck mass um, or has a really large tumor in which we can't, you know, regardless of what instruments or tools we use, that the surgery will be too big. Um, we often send our patients for upfront uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And uh, it's a very rigorous, uh, long process to treat this. Um, it often has a lot of side effects. And uh, it takes about uh, five to six weeks of chemotherapy and radiation, uh, sometimes together. But the good news is with HPV cancer, the outcomes are incredible. Um, they're much better than any of the other cancers uh, uh, I deal with, uh, aside from thyroid cancer. The smoking and drinking related head and neck cancer outcomes are poor. I'll, sh I'll show you that later. But the outcomes for HPV cancer are, are great. Um, you know, there's about an 85 to 90% uh, overall survival at five years, which is much better than, than most cancers that you hear about. And it's, this is regardless of whether you use a robot or use chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And so um, this is a very treatable cancer, but you know, our goals um, are really to minimize the side effects, minimize the amount of treatment but deliver the best type of cure. And so this is a question that really is exciting in our field. And there's a lot of, when you go to the conferences for our surgical conferences and, and you know, there's all these debates between the radiation doctors and the surgery doctors trying to figure out, you know, as we move forward, what the best approach is for this cancer. Cause no matter what we do for these patients, we do, we do pretty well. And um, so we're trying to minimize li lifelong effects from radiation and, and surgery. And so we're, you know, this is just a very interesting part of our field. Um, I just also wanted to say that if you do have surgery, if you're a candidate, it doesn't mean that you, you also don't need radio radiation. So sometimes we do surgery as well as other treatments afterward. But one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this disease, uh, and I really wanted to, um, you know, spend some time on is it on it is because Oh, my God, we can actually prevent this, you know, this is just Amazing. So you probably heard of the HPV vaccine. Um, I hope many of you have had the HPV vaccine are eligible, but there is a vaccine that can prevent this horrible cancer as well as other cancers. And so uh, two of the main ones for HPV is Gardasil and Cerevix, and it's a peptide vaccine. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit. I'm, I'm pointing this out now because I'm about to go into my research, which is um, on a different kind of vaccine. But a peptide vaccine is basically a vaccine made out of a protein in which you deliver to somebody, usually intramuscular, and um, you I mean, you've all had vaccines like this growing up, and you, you usually need you know, more than one shot, several shots in order to get build up enough immunity. And then what this really does is it prevents infection of HPV, of the HPV virus. And so it's going to prevent infection. And so it can prevent it protects against strains of HPV that cause cervical cancers, head and neck cancers, genital warts, um, as well as other cancers. Uh, the Gardasil covers uh, nine HPV uh, subtypes. And here's a little picture of what it kind of looks like. And you know, this is really a uh, part of the National Advisory on Immunization Practices. And Gardasil can be given to girls and women and boys and men aged nine through 45 years of age. They just expanded this to 45. So I'm actually eligible, so I'm going to be doing it myself, even though, you know, when you're older, you're at, you're at lower risk because in theory you've been exposed, they have expanded it, and so I would encourage everybody to do it. Um, the NCI designated cancer centers also support routine vaccination. And so I really uh, would like to encourage um, yourself, your children, your grandchildren to get vaccinated. 
and you know it's it's kind of amazing to me these are older figures but they are still pretty relevant is that you know nationwide four out of ten girls are unvaccinated and six out of ten boys are unvaccinated you know there's a lot of um, sort of societal and, and different uh, reasons that people uh, try not to, to, you know, that they don't want to be vaccinated. But I really think that, you know, the vaccine has been demonstrated to be safe and to prevent HPV infection. And, um, you know, I really uh, strongly encourage it. So just to kind of summarize the first half here, um, just some clinical pearls regarding the oropharynx cancer is that oropharynx cancer is on the rise and it has surpassed cervical cancer. And if an adult has a neck mass that will not go away, uh, further investigation and potentially consultation with an otolaryngologist is needed. And I would encourage those eligible for HPV vaccination to talk to your primary care doctor and really can strongly consider obtaining the vaccine. So that's kind of, uh, before I go into the research, that's a little bit about HPV related or pharynx cancer. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions now, or we could wait till the end once I go through the next part. No questions have popped up so far in any of the chat or Q&A boxes, but if okay. anybody does have any, please put those in there and we'll make sure to address them throughout or if, if, if anything at the end of the presentation as well. All right, perfect. All right, so now I'm just gonna move uh, on a little bit to the um, Ocala Royal Dames funded research uh, that, that I've been working on. I just wanna switch gears a teeny bit to a different kind of head and neck cancer. So we just talked about HPV related oropharynx cancer. And so now I'm talking a little bit more about um, the HPV negative. So the non-viral related head and neck cancer. So this is sort of the traditionally smoking, drinking type related cancer. Um, that being said, I have many patients that have never picked up a cigarette in my practice, uh, specifically in the older demographic and affecting females um, that have this cancer as well. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot to learn about this cancer and there's a lot to improve, um, really a lot to improve. And so these types of cancers, when we're talking about the front of the mouth, the jaw, the treatment is very difficult and the primary treatment is surgery. And so often what we do, you see here's a, a picture of a tongue cancer, and this is kind of involving the oral tongue. We have to remove this part of the tongue, uh, usually a big surgery. Sometimes we have to take a part of the jawbone. And then we often have a two-team approach. The surgery can last for several hours, um, up to 12 hours, in which another uh, team comes in and does a reconstruction in order to reconstruct the tongue. And even after this, in the, these advanced cases require radiation uh, with or without chemotherapy and usually lasting for about six weeks. And not unlike the HPV related cancer, there is a very high mortality rate, meaning a lot of people die from this cancer um, or, or recur. And the mortality rate is greater than 50% at five years. So you know, when I do these surgeries, I know that less than half of the people that I operate on are gonna be around in five years. And we haven't really done that much better. I mean, look, we have actually done worse over the past you know, decade or more. The death rate has actually gone, gone up. And when patients have these surgeries, um, if their cancer comes back or spreads, they have very little options. That's also true about the HPV positive cancers. So although we can treat the HPV positive oropharynx cancers with better outcomes or better survival rates, when those cancers come back, they are very devastating. We often can't treat them. And I'm just kind of setting it up to let you know, you know where my research is heading is to help those patients with those recurrent cases, you know, the, the patients that have been through their treatment and has come back and they really have very few options or none. So in HPV negative patients, as well as HPV positive patients, when the, when the cancer comes back, the overall survival is really six to nine months um, and then less than 5% survival in, of, of greater than one year, which is really bad. And so, you know, as a surgeon, I just, I really, we're not doing well enough. You know, we, I do the biggest surgeries. I have the most sophisticated radiation doctors delivering radiation. And we still, you know, we do the best that we can for our patients. Our patients go through all this treatment. And then, you know, a couple months to years later, you know, the disease is back in the lungs or, or it's, it's back, uh, you know, in the mouth. And 
it's just devastating. And so, you know, I've really dedicated my life um, to to more. You know, I, I, cutting out the cancer is is good. It's it's rewarding. I can get rid of it for my patient. But if I can't, you know, help them on that deeper level and improve the field and move the field forward, you know, I just feel like I'm not doing enough. And so, this is what really drives me and what really fuels my research. We just need to do better. We can't we can't be happy with what with what we have um, in terms of treatment of this disease. And so one of the things that's really tricky about this is that these tumors um, they don't just act alone. They're just not cells that keep on re replicating. And when you read about what a tumor cell is, a cancer cell is, it's a can it's a cell that that doesn't listen to the outside and just keeps on growing and dividing and multiplying. But it's it's not this isolated thing, okay? These cells really live within an, an ecosystem that involves the immune system and a lot of different players in the immune system. So the, the cancer cells actually can tell the immune cells around it to be quiet, to stop doing its job, to stop fighting the cancer and let it grow. And then the cancer can actually affect the whole body. It can suppress the bone marrow. It can suppress the lymph nodes and spleen from making new um, healthy lymph lymphatic uh, white blood cells to come fight this tumor. And so the, the understanding this uh, cancer immune ecosystem is very complicated, but this is where um, you know, we really, I believe, need to focus our attentions. And so what we're ultimately trying to do is we're trying to take a cold tumor, so a tumor that has immune cells that are not working they're actually helping the tumor grow what we need to try to do is to take these immune cells and somehow turn them into t cells that are going to fight cancer we want the immune system your own personal immune system to go from kind of sleepy not doing much to fighting the tumor so we've tried what we say is we try to turn a cold tumor so a, a suppressive tumor into a hot tumor that's active and that's ready to fight the cancer. And so I'm sure um, you've all heard about cancer immunotherapy. So this was, you know, the, in 2013, it was a scientific breakthrough of the year. And, you know, no other treatment in, in, in I think, you know, in, in cancer has really just accelerated and revolutionized. I mean, you know, the, the outcomes in melanoma, I and mean, melanoma was a ultimately fatal disease and now Patients are having responses and durable and dur durable responses using immunotherapy, basically activating the immune system. And so one of the things that I've been focusing on is cancer vaccines. So we talked about HPV vaccines. So HPV vaccines are really are preventative, right? So you you they don't have to be incredibly potent. They don't have to act quickly. They just, we need to give it to the kids, to our kids. We need to elicit immune response. Sometimes you need boosters, you know, it can take months or years to really build up this immunity. But as you all know, with cancer, we don't have time for that. We need something that acts much faster, quickly. And so cancer vaccines are very promising. There are different types of cancer vaccines. Um, one of the uh, types of vaccines that my mentor um, has really uh, pioneered is a cell-based vaccine. And this is in which, where we take, basically take the blood out of your body. We uh, do specific processes to isolate the uh, antigen presenting cells or the immune cells are going to help us fight the cancer. We manipulate them and then we give them back to the patient. Now, as you can imagine, it's very expensive and cumbersome to do these types of treatments. It takes a long time. So there are several issues and problems with that. Protein vaccines like the HPV vaccines are great for prophylactic vaccines, but they're not, they don't elicit a strong enough immune response really to really help with our cancer vaccines, excuse me, to help with our with curing cancer. And this leads to the gene based vaccine. So there's there, there are DNA based vaccines. So these are different um, nuclear materials. So material that are uh, that make our cells. So what we can do is we can take DNA, but there is some uh, concern that that DNA can actually integrate into a person's uh, own genome and create problems. And so this is why you know, my lab and my partnerships have really focused on RNA, which is another genetic material that we can um, isolate, we can manipulate, we can engineer in order to get the immune system uh, to behave uh, the way we want it to against cancer. 
And so this is uh, the, the premise of, of our research uh, that, that the Ocala Royal Danes, as well as the National Institutes of Health have been funding. And what we do is we take, this is a personalized platform in which we take the DNA or the RNA, excuse me, from the tumor itself. So we do a biopsy. We isolate the RNA from the tumor. We perform a step called RT-PCR in which we, tr we, we turn all the RNA into something called cDNA. And then we amplify the cDNA in order to create this huge mRNA, what we call as a transcriptome, which is basically representing all of the mRNA or the genetic material that can be expressed in a tumor. We package it into a lipid nanoparticle to create this personalized RNA vaccine. And what we do is we deliver it intravenously. So this is different than you know, the, the vaccines that we give in the, in the arm. Um, we deliver it IV. And this actually can transfect dendritic cells, white blood cells that really can help activate the immune system to cause an anti-tumor effect. And so from as little as 500 biopsy tumor cells, we can manufacture these personalized tumor specific mRNA for delivery via these nano lipoplex lipoplexes to our immune system to efficiently fight against cancer. And so what we have demonstrated in a lot of preclinical work between me and my partner, Dr. Elias Sayer, is that in our custom lipid nanoparticle carrier, we can really reprogram the immune system peripherally. So we can get the bone marrow, we can get the lymph nodes, we can get the spleen to all kind of wake up and start attacking and fighting against cancer. We also can take a cold tumor and transform it to a hot tumor. So we can bring and deliver immune cells to our tumor to help fight the cancer. And all of this leads to increased dendritic cell activation and CD8 T cell trafficking with increased immune cells, all leading to enhanced tumor killing. And so you all might have heard a little bit about some tiny little companies such as Moderna, BioNTech, you know, see there, these are the companies that are really revolutionizing the, um, the COVID vaccine. And you can see that they have, um, we all have different formulations. Uh, the Moderna vaccine has um, an RNA lipoplex in which there's a positive charge in the outside and an RNA negative charge in the inside. And there's also uh, anionic RNA lipo lipoplexes in which the RNA negative charge is on the outside. Now ours is, um, what we do is we layer mRNA into a multi-lamellar nanoparticle. And that way we can really enhance the payload. So we can actually get more RNA, we think, than the other companies to our target. And so it's kind of like an onion where there's multiple layers of lipids, but then in between there's all this RNA that we're delivering. And my partner, uh, Dr. Sayer, has um, several patents and patents pending um, on this technology. I'm, I'm going to go kind of quickly through this. Um, I think I might be running out of time soon. But um, basically what we have demonstrated is that our formulation, which is here, the blue, leads to better uh, tumor activation, or excuse me, immune cell activation and overall survival than the other formulations. We've also demonstrated really great efficacy against these cold tumors in, in mouse models. So if you look here at the head and neck model, if you look at this, this means smaller tumors. And so with our treatment, you get much smaller tumors compared to no treatment. In, in a, a pulmonary osteosarcoma model, you can see that with our treatment vaccine, look at the survival curve. So this means that the mice are living longer than these mice that don't get the treatment. You can see it in a metastatic melanoma line here. You can see here that the treatment creates these longer term survivors when compared to no treatment, which most of the patient, most of the mice are dead by day, say 45. So we've really demonstrated that this vaccine can work in multiple models. In head and neck, just to reiterate here, um, this is here with the vaccine. So these are our head and neck oral cancer models that we use in mice. And so all of this data has laid the foundation um, for um, our next phase of research, which was funded by the Ocala Dames, which is getting into a field called comparative oncology. 
And so it's great that we can do all these wonderful things in mice, right? We can use all these different types of tumor models in mice, but what does that mean? What does that mean? We need to get this in patients. We need to help patients. And so one of the ways to do that and to speed up the process of getting research discoveries from the lab into a human patient is by using or, or uh, by co-opting something called comparative oncology, which is when we capitalize on bio biologically relevant companion animals. Now, these are not lab animals, okay? These are animals that actually have cancer. We did not give them cancer. They live at home, they're pets. And basically by offering these pets treatments that are still in the early phases of testing, it really facilitates the translational research pipeline and it helps us design human clinical trials and it helps us overcome barriers of the traditional preclinical model. So my partner in this is Dr. Carlos Souza. He's a professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at UF. And we are part of a comparative oncology, oncology trials consortium. And so here at UF, we, are, we were really one of the first people to initiate some of these, we are definitely the first to initiate personalized immunotherapy trials for pets. And what we have done is we have found that cats with oral cancer have similarities to human oral cancer. Now, I just want to reiterate, reiterate, these are pets. These are people's pets. We, you know, these are not um, engineered pets or we don't give these, these pets any cancer. However, these pets that get oral cancer actually have clinically and biologically similar cancers to humans. They, uh, when the cancers come in, they can be very aggressive. Uh, they metastasize later on. And when the, when the cancers come back after treatments, often deadly, you can see what the, this is a mass in one of the cat's mouths. And with maximal treatment, the cats usually only have four to six months to live and just weeks without treatment. And it is also known that secondhand tobacco smoke is implicated in the pathogenesis of this type of cancer. Cats from smoking households are at higher risk and they have similar genetic properties and uh, immuno immunologic properties to cancers affecting humans. And so what the, we've initiated a study sponsored by the Ocala Royal Dames, which has actually been quite successful for, feline, for felines with oral cancer. And so our aims were to determine the safety, feasibility, and tolerability of our personalized RNA nanoparticle vaccines for felines with oral cancer. And these are client-owned owned felines who actually, we have a, a cat that traveled from Georgia just to, just to come here and do this. And we've enrolled uh, two patients so far. We have another one that we're gonna start treatment next week. But basically we perform a biopsy of their tumor. We create the vaccine in our lab, and then we administer three weekly uh, vac vaccinations. And we have been doing a dose escalation scheme. So this is Sam, uh, this is his tumor. You can see oral cancer tumor right here. This is Sally. Sally has a nasal um, tumor here that um, has been partially resected. And these cats are our first uh, cats to undergo this treatment. Um, they, uh, just like in dogs, um, they underwent, they had a fever initially, uh, which spiked, but then recovered. We've been making great progress. Like I said, we enrolled those two cats. And we have one starting treatment next month. Uh, so far, the cats have tolerated three vaccines. We were able to dose escalate safely. The cat stayed, the first time they stayed one night in the, in the hospital, but the next do, uh, two vaccines, they were able to go home with their owner. Uh, minimal side effects, as I mentioned, just that temperature increase, they tolerated it very well. We showed um, an, with the uh, uh, preliminary data that there is an immune response, that the cats are having immune response. And my partner, Elias Sayar, who also has funding from the Ocala Royal Dames, has done a similar study in canines and dogs with, with malignant gliomas. And because, and has shown uh, survival benefit in uh, the six dogs they've treated. So you can see here that the dogs that they've treated had better overall survival than the dogs that did not receive treatment for malignant gliomas. And what we demonstrated, I'll go quickly, is that um, in these, in these uh, larger animals, we activate the immune system profoundly. We generate something called an interferon alpha response, which is, uh, which is very helpful in, in waking up the immune system. 
And we also are able to get specific immune cells that we know are active in fighting against cancers. And so what is the point of all this? So the point is not only to help pets, not only to help humans, but to really facilitate this translational pipeline. So when we learn from our cats, when we learn from our dogs in larger animals, we can, they're, they're closer to humans. We can educate our preclinical studies. We can optimize. We can go back to the mice and ask different questions. We can, we can use RNA engineering to tweak our formulations to then put it into human clinical trials in the best formulation possible. And because of the support of the Ocala Royal Dames uh, for Dr. Sayer and my work, um, this actually led to FDA approval of this. Uh, so we have um, for brain cancer, we have an FDA IND, which will allow University of Florida uh, to initiate first in human clinical trials. Right now, the uh, FDA IND is for brain cancer, and I'm hoping to follow with head and neck cancer. Um, and so this work actually led you know, to the ability for us to, to be able to put this into humans. And so you know, what we were able to do is, is hopefully, you know, basically try to get this translation gap from, from a, an amazing discovery you find in a lab you know, to, to an FDA approval of a drug you know, using these types of models and, 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 and using um, sort of out of the box thinking and, and using uh, a way to really get a group of people dedicated uh, to, to pushing you know, a discovery through all this process, you know, has really led to this um, FDA IND and hopefully will, will lead to a, uh, an informed, well-designed clinical trial based on all of our information, you know, to help cure our patients and move this field forward. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank, of course, Ocala Royal Dames and um, the College of Central Florida for allowing me to talk today. Um, the Ocala Royal Dames has really uh, been instrumental in helping me uh, achieve this uh, feline trial, which I think is really doing great. We're so excited about the preliminary results. And, um, you know, I couldn't do this without a, a lab effort and the, uh, the vet med collaborator, specifically Elias Sayer, who is my uh, partner in all this um, and who has been my fearless leader. And so I'm very grateful for um, all of this help. And of course, the UF Health Cancer Center has been incredibly supportive of my work. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Silver, for your presentation. It was definitely eye-opening. Uh, we did have some questions sure. um, from the audience. So I wanna go run through them with you. Um, this actually comes from our nursing students who are watching um, at this time. Um, they want to know, what do you think nurses can do to help with prevention of ENT cancers? Awesome. Yes, thank you, nurses. So um, I think, you know, there are different levels, of course, but, in, you know, in your clinicals, uh, you know, like I said, the, the more common cancers that are happening now are the ones that are oropharynx cancers. So, you know, as you're doing your physical exams, as you're talking to patients, if there's if patients are noticing neck masses, you know, in that demographic, you know, definitely be suspicious, have that suspicion. Encouraging vaccination is huge. You know, if we can prevent this and, and make this cancer go away, you know, that is just, you know, that is where you guys can really make a difference because you're on the front lines, you're talking to patients, you know, some patients may be hesitant for whatever reasons, but you all, you know, I think can be incredibly influential in that. And so I would encourage you to just, you know, just to understand what types of, of cancers can affect the head and neck and then, you know, speak up, be vocal about it and, um, and really encourage vaccination. Our next question actually um, adds on to what you just said. What is your advice to nurses for most effectively educating and encouraging patients to become vaccinated? So, you know, so there are a lot of resources online that you can look at, you know, there's pamphlets, there's things like that. I think, you know, just using the uh, approach to listen to the patient, you know, say, okay, what are you, what are your worries? What are your concerns? And, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize all the cancers that these vaccines can prevent. You know, I think um, because there is some stigma of it being associated with, uh, you know, sexual activity. You know, I have patients that literally have had one partner their whole lives that have ever gotten this cancer. It's just sometimes it doesn't, you know, there's, there's just sort of misconceptions of things. And so I think really engaging the patient 
and, and trying to understand what their hesitations are and then using, you know, evidence and education. Um, and if you're not sure what they are, you know, there are many tools online, um, you know, through the NCI websites and, and things like, and the vaccination website, CDC, that can help um, maybe allay some fears um, uh, for the patients. All right, our next question we have, um, this is regarding mRNA vaccines. Yeah. Because they are so personalized, what will this look like in clinical, clinical trials and for approvals? Right. So. So yes, yeah, so the idea is eventually to develop an off the shelf vaccine as well. So for HPV, in fact, we can develop an E67, which are the primary viral oncogenes. We can actually spike, you know, we can actually create a vaccine against HPV related cancers. Um, and so that is, is part of our goal. Um, the way this would look like for approvals and what we do have approval for right now is that we do a biopsy from a patient and literally that patient's vaccine is created specifically for that patient. It's, you know, it, it takes us about a week to make it. Um, and we have um, a facility here at UF, a GMP facility that has been approved, you know, by all the uh, 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 necessary uh, approvals in order to 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 generate this vaccine and deliver it to a human being. Um, ultimately, uh, there's, a, there's a whole science in uh, discovering what types of, what types of proteins or what types of things about a cancer in and of itself can stimulate an immune response. Now, if we're able to discover, say the top 10 neoantigens or you know, the top 10 most common uh, uh, immunogenic uh, uh, factors, then we can start to, to try to develop an off the shelf vaccine in which it could be applied to all patients, you know, so we're not taking a biopsy from a patient. We are just doing it this way at first because unfortunately, the tumor is very, very clever and it often escapes us and we don't know exactly which which neoantigens we can target. And so that's why we're, we're employing this strategy initially is we're just basically taking the whole tumor and saying, okay, something in here is going to help us kill this cancer. But the goal would be eventually to create something that we can just give to all patients. And it's easier for certain cancers like HPV related cancer, because we know, we, we know what the target is. Um, and there are some other cancers such as, um, cancers that have fusion proteins that can be immunogenic. Now we can use our RNA engineering to target those types of thyroid cancers. And so there's a, sort of an unlimited possibility um, for the use of this type of engineering. And so we're really excited, you know, to not only cure, I, you know, obviously I wanna cure head and neck cancer, but you know, it really applies to a lot of different cancers. And that's why this platform is so promising. Thank you. All right, um, uh, this was also from our, um, nursing area here at CF. How do the advances with the mRNA technology for the COVID-19 vaccine, um, how will that affect this research? Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of funny. That's a good question because, you know, I, I personally think that it will help us so much, you know, with the acceptability of this because this got fast tracked, you know, I mean, can you, it took us many years to get this FDA IND approval. I mean, our formulation is much different, but I think that having this become so popularized, yes, it you know might it might create competition, right? I mean, that's you know there's multi-billion dollar companies that are in this space. That being said, we have a completely different formulation. We have our you know our own uh, uh, intellectual property and technology that we're trying to move forward. We believe that for cancer, our formulations better. You know, we deliver intravenously. You know, the the other formulations are delivered. Uh, you know, in a completely different way. And so, I think I, I guess you have to look at it. You know, glass full, half full, or empty. I really do believe that this is going to help us with our the acceptability for our phase one and our you know initial uh, trials um, in in human patients for this because because it's not going to be so unfamiliar now that that this uh, is the way we went with COVID vaccination. I have uh, one more question so far. Um, with the many types of the HPV virus, um, do you have to test for each one regarding treatment? Um, how do you find and treat 
with so many available um, types? Sure. So we not all there's only a couple types that cause cancer. So usually we don't really care about most of the types. So if there's, you know, a hundred, uh, 195, we don't care about, you know, it, it, people get them, they clear them, don't care. There are several known subtypes, HPV 16, 18, 31, 30, you know, there are a couple that cause the problem. And so when we really what we do uh, when we do testing uh, for HPV in our patients to decide if they're eligible for specific treatments is um, we take a tumor biopsy and then we actually test for a downstream um, protein called P16. We actually don't even test for the HPV subtype um, that really gives us um, almost a 99% accuracy of having a, a patient having been infected by HPV. And so that's how we sort of test that now. So right now, the different subtypes aren't as important. We just know which ones cause cancer and, and, and warts and other things like that. And then that's what we put into our vaccine, uh, which is a, a preventative vaccine. So, you know, to prevent the infection. Once a patient has cancer, uh, the subtype is usually assumed that it's one of the, the bad ones. And it doesn't really matter um, at that point. We kind of treat, treat the patient the same. We just have to decide initially, is this HPV positive or negative disease? Because then the treatments can become different. Okay, thank you. All right, Thanks. I believe we've actually gone through all of our questions um, uh, through our live feed. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna make sure, yeah. Um, I wanna thank you, Dr. Silver, so much for joining us oh, today. Oh, thank you for having me. I hope um, you guys enjoyed it. it. Thank you. Wonderful. I know our audience has definitely enjoyed it. We have uh, several across our campus plus our live online audience. So thank you everyone Excellent. for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Silver, for your expertise. Um, and I know hey, that everyone- if, I just wanna wants... say if anyone has any questions or, you know, I, I'm, I'm here at UF, you know, you can get in touch with me. I think Peggy can pro provide my information. I'm happy to, you know, reach out to someone and talk to them if they have more questions offline. Yes, yes. And we are going to um, make this video available um, on our Facebook page, um, it's going to be available at the CF Shop Talk page as well. And I'd be happy, of course, for Dr. Silver to be able to share it as well um, in her field. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for our audience for joining us today. And um, we look forward to our next Shop Talk presentation. Um, thank you again to Ocala Royal Dames. Yeah, thank you, um, Ocala Royal Dames. Yes, very much so. Um, this would not be possible without them. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. Silver, for joining us. Of course. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and we hope that um, everybody has a wonderful afternoon.